hey, have I got good news for you. The devil is going to get it. I mean, God is going to bring him down. That mighty Leviathan that exalted himself and thought he could rule over the earth is going to be brought down. And you, you then are going to be released from his pressure and from his adversarial tactics. We'll talk about it today. ever watched a movie and you've watched that villain move and you've watched what he's done and how he has manipulated people and how he has lied to them and how he has destroyed them and sought to ruin them? What do you want? Do you want him to succeed? Not if you're normal. You want him to get it. And that's what God tells us in Isaiah chapter 24, 25, 26, and 27, he's telling us as he brings this segment of Isaiah to a close, hey, the devil is going to get it. Now, it's, 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 it's hidden in, in, in a way until you stop and, and, and you really analyze what God is saying in this segment of Scripture. Remember, Isaiah chapter 24 starts off with God laying the earth waste, God despoiling the earth. Now we've come to Isaiah chapter 27, and what he's going to show us is he is not only going to despoil the earth, but he's going to get the one that is in, in, in heaven, that has access to heaven, and that is tormenting the people on the earth. He's going to get them. He's going to go after them. Listen very carefully to Isaiah chapter 27, and let me just tell you this. Thank you, precious one. Thank you so very, very, very much for, for coming alongside and for studying the Word of God. You know that you can find a free study guide by going to preceptsforlife.com, preceptsforlife.com, and you can download that study guide and you can grow with us. And that's the whole purpose of this program is to take you through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and let you discover truth for yourself. So one of the things that we tell you to do is mark time phrases. And one of the time phrases that is very important in the book of Isaiah is in that day. Because God tells you in different segments of the book what he's going to do. And then he says, in this day, in that day, in that day, in that day. So this song opened up in Isaiah 26, verse 1, within that day. Now we've come to another in that day. It says, in that day, chapter 27, verse 1, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeting, fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword. God is going to come down. He's going to take that fleeing, that running Leviathan, and he's going to bring his sword down on him. And then it says this, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill, this is so important, the dragon who lives in the sea. Now, some people think that what God is talking about is a literal sea monster, a literal sea creature. And, he go, and you can go to scriptures and you can find out that God describes a sea creature. But you can also go to the scriptures and take this, take the word serpent, take the word dragon who lives in the sea, take the context 
of this passage. And remember, context is always king. It always rules over interpretation. So the context, and, and you have to remember that in the Bible, there were no chapter divisions. There were no uh, verses. Somebody went in and put them in, and I'm so glad so that we can, we can see where we are and, and uh, find it in a hurry. But now watch what he says. Let's go back to verse uh, chapter 26. Come, my people, enter into your room and close the door behind you. Close the door behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. Whose indignation? A righteous God's indignation. When God sent his son the first time, he came to die for our sins. When he comes the second time, he is coming for judgment. So it says, for behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place. It says to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain in that day. Do you see the connection? The Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Now, when he talks about that, why would he be talking about the earth and then talking about a sea monster? Remember, God is going to judge not only the earth, but God is going to judge the heavens. And this is what we saw as we studied Isaiah chapter 24 and 25 in verse Isaiah 24, 21, it says, So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of earth on the earth. So let me run a few cross-references with you. Let me take you to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And let me show you something. In Revelation Chapter 12, verse 9. And, and, and what I want you to understand is when you study the book of Genesis and you put it together with the book of Revelation, it's absolutely incredible. And it is incredible because what God starts and shows you in the beginning, he brings to a conclusion. So in Genesis chapter 3, we have a serpent coming into the garden. And that serpent tempts Eve, and Eve takes the fruit of the tree. The serpent lies about God. The serpent accuses God. He's saying, God knows in the day that you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will be like God. You will know good and evil. In other words, you don't need to know God. Well, when you come to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, listen to what he says. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. I mean, he is going to get it. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So he's, draw, he's describing to you the dragon, the serpent of old. It is the devil. And so he tells us that that serpent that came into the garden was the dragon, the, the arch enemy of God. Now, when you come to Revelation chapter 13, listen carefully. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea having 10 horns and seven heads and on his horns were 10 diadems and on his head were blasphemous names. And it says, and I saw one of his heads and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast and they worshiped, now listen carefully, the dragon because he, the dragon, the serpent of old that comes out of the sea, he gave his authority to the beast. So when you look at this Leviathan, 
the fleeing serpent with his fierce, God is going to get him with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. God is going after the unholy trinity. God is going after the unholy trinity. Trinity. Look at Revelation chapter 19. I just want to take you all through Revelation. Forgive me. I'm just excited about it. But Revelation chapter 19 and look at verse 11. And it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and he wages war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron, the striking of the nations. Who is over the nations? Who is the prince of this world? Well, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 tells you that it is the devil. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, and they are going to get it. And so... In verse 19 of Revelation 19, they're assembled to make war against God. And it says in verse 20, And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet. This is the unholy trinity who performs signs in his presence, in the presence of the beast, by which he deceived those who took the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast is a number of man's names, 666. Those who worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And then you go to chapter 20, verse 3, and listen to what it says. And Well, in verse 1, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan. This is the Leviathan, I believe, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after this, he will be released for a short time. Oh my goodness, what's gonna happen when he's released? What's gonna happen to the earth? Stay tuned. We'll talk about it. The devil, as I said in the first part of the program, is going to get it. God is going to judge him. God is going to punish him. Now, I left him in the BP, in the bottomless pit. I left him there for a thousand years because that's what God says is where he's going to be for a thousand years. And then during that thousand years, Jesus Christ is going to reign. Where is he going to reign? On his holy mountain in Jerusalem, in that strong city that you and I have. But what happens at the end of the thousand years? Because he's just in a bottomless pit. Well, I want us to go back to Revelation and let's look again at Revelation chapter 20. Because in Revelation chapter 20, we are coming to the close of the word of God and the close of, of God's explanation of what is going on. His progressive revelation is coming to completion. And in verse 7 of Revelation 20, it says, And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. You say, well, he didn't get it, did he? Oh, yes, he did. He will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four 
corners of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand on the seashore. And it says, and they came up on a broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. Go and hide yourself for a little while until the indignation is past. And it says, and the number of them, uh, he gathers them, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. What's the beloved city? Jerusalem. And it says this is his final showdown. I mean, this is high noon when those guys are walking out at high noon and they are facing one another and the guns are drawn and the shot is fired. And the enemy, the devil, goes down. Listen to what it says. And the beloved city and fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, we've covered chapter 27, verse 1, and we've got to move on. And as we move on, what we come is we come to this glorious song of the vineyard. It says in verse 2, in that day, a vineyard of wine, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Now remember, in Isaiah 5, we saw this vineyard that the Lord planted, but it didn't bear fruit. But now we're at the other end of the spectrum. I, the Lord, am its keeper. I water it every moment so that no one will damage it. I guard it day and night. I have no wrath. Should someone give me briars and thorns in battle, then I would step on them. I would burn them completely or let him rely on my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me in the days to come. Jacob, he's talking about the nation of Israel, will take root. Israel will blossom and sprout and they will fill the whole world with its fruit. In other words, there's a day coming when Israel will be the centerpiece of all the earth and they will spread and fill the whole world with its fruit. You say, how can a righteous God do that? Israel turned their back on, on the Messiah. Israel was part along with the world, but it was really God that crucified his son. How can they do that? Well, because how can he do that? He's doing it. A righteous God is doing it because he's judged them and they've responded. Have you been judged by God and not responded? Have you allowed, so to speak, the devil to get a stronghold in your life and you followed that for a while? But God, God judged you, didn't he? He chastens you. But when he's finished chastening you, then he wants to bless you. Like the striking of him who has struck them, he struck them. Has he struck them? Or like the slaughter of his slain, have they been slain? He says, you, God, contended with them by banishing them, by driving them away. And that's what God said he would do in Deuteronomy. If you do not obey me, I will disperse you. I will scatter you among the nations. He says, with this fierce wind, he's, he expelled them on the day of the east wind. Therefore, through this, Jacob's iniquity will be forgiven. Because God has judged him and it's over. And this will be the full price of pardoning his sin. It says, when he has made the altar stones like pulverized chalk stones. In other words, he's come and he's torn down the altars. He's pulverized them. When ashram and incense altars will not stand. And then he contrasts it again with the city. The city that is re in rebellion against God. The city that is opposed to God. And it says this, for the forti fortified city is isolated. A homestead, a pasture forlorn and forsaken like the desert. There the calf will graze. There it will lie down and feed on its branches. When the limbs are dried, they are broken off. Women come and make fire with them. For they are not a people of discernment. Therefore, their maker will not have 
compassion on them. What is he saying? Once again, he's contrasting the fate of the righteous with the unrighteous. He's contrasting the fact that the righteous have peace with him because they trust in the Lord, because they have an everlasting rock. But these have forsaken him. And he says, therefore, their maker, their maker will not have compassion on them, on this fortified city. And their creator will not be gracious to them. These are the wicked that continue to do wickedly. And so he says, in that day, and he brings us to this glorious final close in this segment. In that day, the Lord will start his threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates, go over to Iraq and imagine that Euphrates there. To the brook of Egypt, go down south to Egypt, to the brook. And it says, and you will be gathered one by one, O sons of of Israel. I'm going to gather you. I'm going to restore. What is chapter 27 all about? Chapter 27 is about the destruction of the serpent, the one that brought enmity between them, uh, between the serpent and the woman, the one that stirred up all this hatred for the Jews, the one that caused people to come against Israel simply because they were Jew, a persecution of the Jews. That serpent is going to be destroyed and God is going to go out and every Jew that has survived his judgment, he is going to bring back. He is going to gather them. And listen to what it says. He says, you will be gathered one by one, O sons of Israel. It will come about in that day. Mark it again, that a great trumpet will be blown and those who were perishing in the land of Assyria and who were scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord at the mountain in Jerusalem. There is a day of a blowing of a great trumpet. And you know what? First Thessalonians chapter four tells us that God is going to blow a trumpet too. And the dead in Christ, in Christ are going to rise and be caught up together with those that are alive and remain and meet the Lord in the air. There's a trumpet for the church. There's a trumpet for Israel. And there is triumph by God over the enemy. This is what he's saying. So mark those in that days and know what God is going to do as he brings his sons from afar. As they come up from Egypt, remember there's a highway from Egypt to Assyria. As they come down from Assyria, they're going to come to worship God at the mountain in Jerusalem. Oh God, what a glorious day awaits us. Ooh, would I love an hour to teach you. <laughs> I tell you, these 30 minutes go by so very quickly, don't they? Thank you for studying. Thank you for staying faithful. Thank you for going through Isaiah with me. What is your precept for life today, beloved? Your precept for life today is to remember that there is a day of triumph coming. It's a day of triumph because it is a day of destruction of the evil one, of that twisted serpent, of that beast, that serpent, that, uh, that dragon that comes out of the sea. It is an ultimate triumph because God is going to get him. Remember Revelation chapter 12. Now, I did not read this, but I want to read it to you. It says in verse 12 of Revelation chapter 12, it says, well, let me start at verse 10. Now I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them day before our God, day and night. 
and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. They belong to Jesus. And because of the word of their testimony, greater is he, Jesus, that's in us than he that's in the world. And they did not love their lives even when they were faced with death. This devil may be allowed to kill them. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And it says, for this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. O oh, beloved, know this that he is a defeated enemy and live accordingly. Take your authority in Christ and smite him with the word of God, which is the offensive weapon of the child of God. When it tells us in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God, it, you put it on and then you take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Thank you for sharpening your sword. Thank you for learning how to wield that sword, learning how to duel and come out the victor. Thank you for persevering. Thank you for studying God's word, precept upon precept. Thank you for watching today. All the programs you see on Precepts for Life are available on CD and DVD. To order your copy of today's program, log on to our website at preceptsforlife.com. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life.